Welcome to today's Food Waste Action Network Lunch and Learn. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're excited you're here and hope you have a bite to eat as we enjoy lunch and learn about today's topic, the evolution of food recovery to meet changing needs. During our last Lunch and Learn, we learned about newly introduced policies that could drive food waste reduction, like the Zero Food Waste Act, which would create a new EPA grant program that will investigate food waste mitigation policies and projects like food recovery projects, which is what we'll be exploring today. Now, even before the pandemic, roughly 40 million Americans experienced food insecurity at any given time. Meanwhile, nearly 35% of the total food produced in the United States is surplus food, and only 3% of that surplus food is actually donated. In the wake of the devastation wrought by the coronavirus pandemic, those figures skyrocketed. There was an increase in business closures and people swelling the unemployment rolls, which resulted in a spike in need for greater food access and food, in, food security. In turn, the call for food recovery organizations and their counterparts across the broader food waste ecosystem to be innovative and scale was never more urgent. And that's why in May of last year, ReFed launched the COVID-19 Food Waste Solutions Fund to quickly deliver vital funding to mid-sized organizations across the U.S. that could rapidly scale food waste reduction and hunger relief efforts, with a particular focus on the rescue of fresh, healthy food from farms and dignified, convenient last mile delivery to the increased number of Americans facing food insecurity. ReFed was able to quickly raise $3.5 million from 60 donors and re-granted 100% of that funding to 37 for-profit and non-profit organizations selected from over 200 applicants. Together, the grantees distributed over 90 million pounds of food to more than 8 million individuals across the nation. Now, it's been a little over a year and a half since the nation declared a state of emergency. And it's still not entirely clear whether the immediate impacts of COVID-19 are long-term, but today we'll be hearing from a few of the grantees of the fund about what they're seeing on the ground and how they've expanded and scaled their services during the pandemic, as well as how their audacity led to new initiatives and innovations and what food rescue might look like in the future. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speakers. Joining us today is Robin Manthe, who is the Managing Director of Minnesota Central Kitchen at Second Harvest Heartland, where she leads a network of kitchens and distribution partners to take rescued food and transform it into over 1 million meals annually to feed people who are facing barriers to preparing meals. Welcome, Robin. Now, Robin, Minnesota Central Kitchen was just a temporary crisis response at the height of COVID, but now has become a formalized program, which is why you're actually there now. Um, and so I wanna know more about why that model and how that model came to be and, and why the decision to fully integrate it. Yeah, thank you for having me today. As mentioned, I'm the Managing Director of Minnesota Central Kitchen. We're really the prepared meals arm of Second Harvest Heartland, the food bank. and. The reason for this is we know groceries are not always the solution to fighting hunger. Sometimes people have barriers preparing a meal, whether that be inconsistent access to a kitchen, physical ability, or living through crisis. And so the story of how this started was March 2020, everything shut down. A few chefs, restaurateurs, hunger organizations got together over a weekend and talked about what they could do. And days later, 600 meals were delivered to folks free of cost. And thanks to partners like Refed and other donors, we're now coming up on our 2 millionth meal. And we've done it all through partnership, partnerships. So as you've mentioned, we know the need is there and now we know the structure that can work. And that structure has three components, as you'll see. It starts with the end user's need. So meeting people where they are today with a prepared meal that meets their requirements. We have more than 50 partners who get those meals out, about 25,000 meals a week. In the middle, we have the innovative part for us, which is the kitchens. We have 12 kitchens. They are all locally owned. We pay them to take donated goods, rescued foods, and turn them into healthy meals. We've kept businesses in business. We employ 100 to 200 people at any given time actually making these meals. And at the beginning is what food banks do best, rescuing the food. 
60 to 80 percent of every meal is rescued food and that's why we're here today so moving that through the system the parts that are innovative unique about us we are a central kitchen but we're not actually centralized we have 12 kitchens as we mentioned that makes us a little different from dc central and maybe closer to a world central kitchen it's also a for-profit nonprofit partnership so we are paying these restaurants to do the work but they actually bill us their actual costs. So it's a variable payment with no profit included. So we're really all on the same team in terms of efficiency, which has made this more sustainable long-term. And finally, it's all about being community connected. So these meals are not only made in the communities, we want them to be made by people who look like the folks in the community. So that means halal meals, the big scratch cooking kitchen in our local, like in the, the largely African-American neighborhood. We have Mexican restaurants, Cambodian restaurants, and others kind of by community for community. That's and so, yes, we're long-term and we're expanding. Yeah. So we're not only COVID response, but we're launching in Rochester next week, Rochester, Minnesota, that is. Um, and we're working with Feeding America to put together the toolkit of how you could use this kind of partnership model more broadly. Wonderful. And, and real quick, before we go to the next speaker, Robin, um, while I have you, do you have an ask and an offer for our audience today? Yeah, I'd say asks are, we're growing, so support and the monetary is always needed. And if anybody has ideas, we need a lot more food service pack food donations versus traditional retail pack that our food bank uses. So if you have ideas about how we can bring that in, I'd welcome them. And then an offer, I'm happy to talk about that unique model of the partnering with for-profit and using uh, kind of the variable reimbursement or anything about our partnership model. That sounds great, Robin. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Next up is Adam Lowy. I'm going to get that right. Adam is the executive director of Move for Hunger, which uses a unique national logistics network of trucking capacity and movers to rescue and transport food to those in need and a father to a new baby hunger fighter to add to the Move for Hunger family, which is very exciting. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, would love for you to tell us about the work you did during COVID to really scale Move for Hunger's impact and move perishable food. Thanks for having me. Um, so Move for Hunger started about 12 years ago. We focused on uh, recovering non-perishable food to start um, from people that were moving. Um, we partnered with a network of moving companies that were in people's homes anyway. Um, they picked the food up. They delivered this food to local food banks in their community. We went from one mover, my family's moving company, to 1,100 across all 50 states in Canada. And really what we've been trying to do is make food recovery just kind of a core part of the way these industries do business. As we learned more about food waste, as we learned more about food insecurity and talked to our food banking and pantry partners all across the United States, they would tell you that one of their number one challenges was actually transportation. Unfortunately for us, that was one of the things that we really had available, transportation, trucks, drivers, boxes, warehouses, et cetera, and really what we're trying to do is set that to purpose. Um, we, like many, saw during COVID-19 um, the devastating news stories of crops rotting in the fields. I'm hearing the stories of farmers struggling to get food to where it needs to be, as well as wholesalers, uh, you know, CPG companies, distributors, trying to just figure out what to do with that food so it didn't have to go to waste. Um, so we stepped in, and really what we're trying to do now for the first time ever um, is figure out how can we do better making sure that we can uh, get perishable foods to food banks and pantries. And we're doing that in a few ways uh, that I'm really excited about. First um, is our, our truck share pilot, which is where we are providing free transportation resources from farms directly back um, to a handful of agencies. Um, so a number of agencies that we've spoken to oftentimes will pick food up from the farms in maybe a van or a pickup truck, and they're doing multiple trips per week but we found that if we could send a truck and a driver and maybe pick up a couple of pallets, it would reduce their costs uh, and increase their ability to distribute more of that food. Additionally, we found that cold storage was a big issue as well. Um, so we're also looking to team up uh, with some farms and different sites to determine where could we put a cold storage hub, even if it's directly on that farm, to add more flexibility to the system. Sometimes there's a major gleaning event happening on a weekend, but the food bank isn't open to accept the food. But if we can keep that food cold and fresh through the weekend until a time where a food bank can accept it or a, a truck can come pick it up, you're gonna be much more likely to see food uh, ultimately get to where it needs to be. 
Over 12 years, we've delivered 24 million pounds of food to food banks and pantries, feeding 20 million people, um, including 4 million people last year alone. Um, and we're just really excited to continue to collaborate in this space with Refed and its supporters to figure out how we can do more. Amazing, thank you. And do you have an ask or an offer for our audience today, Adam? I, I do, I'll start with the offer for anybody listening today that needs transportation support or want, would like to think creatively how we can provide free transportation for a fresh food um, to uh, pantries and, and food banks, please let us know, we'd love to collaborate with you. And as for an ask, we've got a really unique opportunity in Rhode Island with a fishery where we've got the ability to recover between two and 5,000 pounds of fresh fish per week. And we want to put in a cold storage hub um, up there off the, off the pier, closer to, to central location. Um, we've scoped this out, we've spec'd it out, we've got all the partners ready and we're trying to raise $50,000 um, to really put this, install this. Um, it's a one-time cost and will allow us to do this for years to come. So if anyone's interested in helping us recover fresh fish, it's new for us, but super exciting. Love that. Exciting stuff. Thanks for being here, Adam. Thank you. Also joining us today is Chanel Charest, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Bitwise Industries and spearheaded the launch of the Take Care app during COVID-19, which is a custom software that streamlines requests from underserved communities and supports the coordination of grocery pickups and deliveries. Hi, Chanel. Thanks for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> Um, so, oh, go yeah, ahead. Tell us, no, I was going to say, tell us, <laughs> tell us more about the Take Care app. <laughs> so I work for a company called Bitwise Industries. Take Care was our response to COVID basically in March of 2020. You know, we all went shelter in place. We were a company at that time of 120 folks um, who work in the technology industry. We also have physical locations. So we had about 30 to 40% of our workforce actually no longer had active positions at that time. So folks who are running our buildings or working in classrooms or doing those kinds of things. And so we were able to commit those folks to building this initiative. Um, so it's a technology solution, uh, basically that we, we use these folks to, um, at first, literally answer a phone and take a grocery order and then go out and pick up those groceries and deliver them to a home of someone who could not go out because of the pandemic. That's where it started. Because we're a technology company, we thought, hey, maybe we can build a solution for this that doesn't require us all answering phones. Mm -hmm. um, so we built a platform uh, in Salesforce that allowed us to utilize uh, also Twilio uh, to connect to that, to then take orders. Uh, we partnered with a local nonprofit called Neighborhood Industries, who actually works in the um, clothing recycling side of the side of the world and also workforce development. Um, and basically they had a fleet of trucks and drivers who were no longer doing the same work they were doing. And we said, hey, if we partner with you, let's keep everyone employed and see if we can't get food out to folks who need it. And so then we hit up the food bank and said, hey, do you guys do delivery? They're like, no, like we haven't, you know, we haven't implemented that yet. And so we said, hey, We've got these folks who want to do intake. We've got these folks who want to deliver. Would you be the food supplier? And so basically connected all three of those arenas um, and continued to iterate on the software platform, continued to reach out and see if it was a solution um, for folks in the community. And what was great about how Refed came in was that they came in right at this funding moment where we as Bitwise had contributed over $100,000 to the effort as just philanthropy money um, from, from our organization. And Refed came in with the grant and it actually was the bridge dollars that allowed us to get into the program from a city level, which we were granted 1.2 million and were able to completely offboard the program into our nonprofit partner um, and allow them to keep going through, through the pandemic. So it was really this rapid fire response, but what it did was open the door uh, for us to be able to understand a little bit more of this food insecurity that had always been talked about, but was just escalated um, by the pandemic. And then looking at, uh, we worked with Cat Taylor's office as well and looking at, because we're in the Central Valley, right? We are in the bread basket, literally 80% of the food <laughs> in the country comes from here. And so how do we now directly work with marginalized populations, um, farming communities um, to get food straight from the source? So yes, we wanna continue with food bank partnerships, but how do we now work with farmers and then because of Refed also working with folks like uh, Aloha Harvest as well to 
really understand the struggles and what is missing from a technology standpoint and how can we better bridge that gap. So it is an ongoing learning process. We're now seeing food insecurity as not just a COVID response, but a human response. We're at a point now where the entire um, country has shifted, the economic divide has grown, and food insecurity, we believe, is a 100% like human right, uh, like humans should have food. And yeah. so how do we as a for-profit organization step in and help close that gap with the tools and skill sets that we have? So we're on an ongoing mission to learn from the organizations that are on the ground specific to what Am uh, Adam's talking about, what Robin spoke about, and we know that that those are the experts, but we can also offer this tool. So how do we continue to have those conversations? Um, in COVID, we did expand uh, outside of California. So we're now in Toledo, Ohio, and then we will be in, it sounds like uh, Alabama, New York, New Mexico, Texas, um, and I think I'm missing another, but through this next year. And so really, I think from this call, the ask is, can we make more partnerships across the country that we could potentially help a network with to make sure that the folks who are interacting with us understand what's available to them? And then also how do we engage technology to really push these efforts forward? Um, and I think that that includes funding. And because yeah. we are you know, operating in a world where funding is such a huge part of what we do. We're in our, I think we're going into our series C. Um, so we're in that world actively, lots of federal dollars. We've just stood up a, a 501c3 and philanthropy um, efforts internally. So we're looking at ways at which we can actually help provide those dollars to existing partners. Um, Love that. So I think I ran through all your things, but tell me <laughs> if I missed anything. <laughs> no, that was amazing. I didn't know. You did a great job. Thanks for great. sharing, Chanel. Awesome. Uh -huh. Uh, perfect. Up next, I'm excited to welcome on the screen Aiden Riley, who is the co-founder of the Farm Lake Project, which really started as a grassroots movement by college students and then grew to be this large organization um, that really developed a new supply chain that provided logistics and distribution uh, to move surplus food from farms to food banks, while also providing economic relief for farmers and truckers. Um, so Aiden, thank you for being with us today. Um, I know FarmLink is primarily a volunteer-run organization, but I mean, your impact was incredible and, and you continue to have a great impact. Could you tell us more about what FarmLink is up to and um, its latest Carbon Link initiative? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, as you said, we, we popped up as a super grassroots project that, that's always been this part of our identity of, you know, we didn't know anything about this space really uh, at the beginning and, and we didn't know how to book a truck. We didn't know how to do this or that. So what we had to do was we had to listen and then pay attention to the space and to the people who have been doing this for a long time before we did and then see, okay, what's the best place we could, you know, put our effort and not be redundant, but be helpful to the people who are uh, existing now. So that's what we, that's what we started doing um, in April of 2020. Um, it began with just, uh, uh, calling farms in around Los Angeles, where I'm from, um, seeing which farms had surplus produce and uh, what they needed. And it was usually transportation because they didn't have a truck to send it to us. So we would rent a truck and drive it ourselves and uh, pick up that food and then drive it on the 405 freeway back to food banks local uh, to me in LA. Um, that grew and grew. We ended up getting more volunteers. We got more attention, which came just more support from around the United States. Um, to date, now we work in all 50 states. Uh, we work with over 100 farms and we've moved about 50 million pounds of food uh, at a rate of going on about 1 million pounds a week now. Uh, and really the way we do that is by working directly with farms and, and, and recognizing that our biggest value add is doing this just-in-time recovery. And um, so the way we do that is... is uh, we do not have cold storage facilities or storage facilities at all. Uh, our team of volunteers who are basically all students, um, average age of 21 years old, about 500 people who have volunteered over the last year, um, have relationships with these hundred farmers across the United States. Uh, they give us a call or we contact them on a daily basis and, and find out what they need and, and what, what's going on at their facility. And when they find out, when we find out what they have, we get it, we make sure that we can get it within a day or so to directly who needs it most. Um, and, you know, what's really shaped the, the, the mindset 
uh, like I said, was 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 is listening and figuring out what is needed uh, the most in the space, and that is like directly informing still what we're doing going into the future. An example of that is like something I I just got off a call on is um, is is working on our our tax calculator, which was we recognize that a lot of farmers around the United States are eligible to get tax deductions back on food that they are donating, and it could be a huge incentive for farmers to want to donate more. Um, and what we did is we went and interviewed all 100 plus farmers that we work with and realized that zero of them um, were getting these tax deductions. And that was because it was on a federal and state level, it was just a little bit too a little bit too complicated. They didn't really have the time to go through and scroll through and see which ones they were eligible for. And we realized that they were leaving thousands of dollars on the table that could be used. So um, what we're building, for example, is a calculator that when we work with a farmer who donates us food, it's going to go um, and scrape the internet and scrape these files to find exactly, oh, you're eligible for this, this, and this one. And then we're going to do the work on their behalf to make sure that they get those deductions back. Uh, that's incredible. That's something we're super excited about. Yeah. Um, the second market that we're exploring is this idea that, you know, like I put up on here, uh, Food waste, if it were a country, would be the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions behind U.S. and China. I don't think that's something that's on um, on most people's radar. Uh, so many people care about the issue of climate change, but don't realize the impact food loss and food waste has in the space. Um, we're, you know, for every truck of food that isn't uh, sold and is being instead sent to the landfill, we're releasing X amount of tons of methane, which we know is 25 uh, times as potent as carbon dioxide. We had a conversation a couple months ago where we, we looked at this emerging market called the carbon credit market, the carbon, carbon offset, um, and recognized that, uh, that for every truck of food that we are diverting from the landfill, we're saving a certain amount of these greenhouse gas emissions from going into the atmosphere. And that makes us eligible for something called the carbon offset credit. Um, and that is of value to spaces in the or in the United States and around the world who want to offset their own carbon emissions, they can purchase that credit. So this is something we're dipping our toes into and exploring is this thing that we're calling carbon link, where we may be able to for every truck that we divert, be able to generate these carbon credits, um, sell these to organizations that need them around the United States, and then generate a profit that goes directly back into food recovery thereby potentially creating this self-sustaining model, which is what we're reaching for in the, in the next, um, in the next, in the foreseeable future. That's incredible. I love that connection and just kind of this new thinking about, you know, just creating a sustainable model. And I guess, um, Adam, before you wrap up, do you have an ask and an offer for the audience today? Yeah. Um, my, I, I haven't, I have an ask and I guess they're sort of intertwined is that I'm, we're really looking for, uh, partnerships right now in Southern California, Washington, D.C., or New York City um, um, that want to help us set up a recurring system of delivering meals to communities in need. And uh, at what we do at FarmLink largely is uh, we're able to source huge amounts of food, but um, a, difficulty, a difficulty we have is that it's largely usually the same type of produce and it comes in huge amounts. So I'm looking for a partnership um, that uh, with an organization that can provide cold storage, uh, mixing uh, facilities, and and or meal preparation. Um, so we can create like an end-to-end -end system in one of these cities where we're bringing it on this end from the farm to the facility, and then we're working together to actually turn that into to real meals because we know that something like a bag of potatoes, it, that, doesn't, that doesn't feed a family. That doesn't help right. a family. So, right. Um, uh, yeah, please message me or reach out if, if, if you're interested in that kind of partnership. Wonderful. Thanks, Aiden. We're excited you're here. Um, well, last but certainly not the least, it's my honor to welcome Nancy Roman, President and CEO of Partnership for a Healthier America, which launched the Fresh Food Fund as a crisis response and true to PHA's name in partnership uh, with the Produce Marketing Association. Uh, Nancy, thanks for being here today. Um, would love to kind of hear more about the growth of the Fresh Food Fund and any latest initiatives like the AI-powered small footprint grocery stores. Oh, I think you're still on mute, Nancy. Thank you, Angel. It's, it's terrific to be here. Um, well, yeah, it, it was really an exciting and unexpected story. I mean, everybody remembers what a tough time March 2020 was. And um, 
Our organization exists really to transform the landscape of food in pursuit of health equity. And our, our work is big systems change, working with companies to incrementally improve food in ways large and small. And when COVID came, we found ourselves being approached by many large retailers who were dumping millions of tons, not pounds, but tons of gorgeous produce into dumpsters. And they were panicked because, you know, their ordinary outlets were overwhelmed. Food banks weren't taking it. Grocery stores were beyond capacity. Restaurants were closed. So we decided to stand up a program that was, we believed very much a short-term bottleneck program to avoid this food waste in the short term. Um, we decided that we would hire furloughed workers from the food industry to pack boxes and distribute them to families in need. But we said, if we're going to do something that's really about food waste and recovery, when our real mission is nourishing people with good, healthy food, we wanted to do it in a way that would leave um, a per something permanent. And so we built it on data showing that if families receive produce two meals a day, um, seven days a week for 12 successive weeks, they actually develop um, habit of produce, a healthy habit of produce. Refed gave us our first 50,000 for that program and it's grown into a program now with more than $10 million in 26 cities. Um, distributing produce um, in various ways um, all across the Midwest, in New Orleans, in Rochester, um, in Memphis, and, and many other cities. And <clears throat> the learnings have been powerful and important. Um, and it bridged to a lot of other work. You know, our goal is that once families develop this healthy habit, that they can actually um, for affordable prices, continue to buy the good food that they want. And of course, access is such a pr problem. So we're experimenting in ways large and small. Um, Angel mentioned one area we're working in with unmanned grocers, where you can put a small format grocery store like an Amazon Go in a low-income neighborhood, and people can come in and with a debit card or a SNAP card, secure the food they need at affordable prices. Um, we're experimenting with meal kits, um, you know, that compete with fast food and price. So part of what we're doing is trying to shake up the model and find um, if different models like meal kits, small format grocery, allow for not just rescued food, but better access to healthy food. And um, it's really been an exciting time. That's amazing. And do you have an ask and an offer for our audience today? Yeah, I, ha I, I could have many, but I'll <laughs> say, you know, I'd say one of the, the primary offer that I have is one of the things I observe in having done this work for, for a long time, both at the global level, um, the community level, running one of the country's largest food banks, and now at the national level, is that we can get siloed between the people doing climate and the people doing food waste and the people doing health. Any one of you, wherever your, your passion and area is, if you are interested in linking to um, really helping people get healthy, sustainable food, I'm willing to speak directly you know, with any person who wants to talk about how their solutions connect to solutions. Our organizations you know, has on the ask side, we have a big bold goal to add 50 million servings of fresh fruits and vegetables into the marketplace. They're sustainable, they have low carbon footprints and they're absolutely critical to preventing diabetes and heart disease. But we also know that um, they can lead to food waste too. So we really need to marry the solutions in health and, and disease prevention with food waste. So, um, my, my ask would be as we pursue that goal, you know, anyone who has a way to bring a, a, a um, food waste piece to it, I, I welcome that conversation very specifically in the Mississippi Delta. Um, we're working in 19 counties in the Delta to, you know, we're sourcing food from black farmers and really trying to get locally grown indigenous crops um, that are nutrient dense to be consumed. And as we do that, um, those who can help, you know, with funds, knowledge, information, ideas, 
about being sure to prevent the food waste as we build out that program would be really welcome. That's great. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, why don't we go ahead and welcome the other speakers on the screen um, and just dive into a, a discussion together. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hearing a lot about how all of you really scaled and expanded your services since March of last year. And I heard partnerships come up a lot. Um, and want to kind of dive into that and talk about, you know, what makes a good partnership and how do you balance what admittedly there is some level of competition in the food rescue space, right? We're all kind of doing similar things in different ways. So how do you have a really productive partnership? And maybe Nancy, if you want to kick us off. Sure. sure. Well, I'm happy to. Partnership is in our name. Um, we're all about partnership. Um, I've never, I always say I haven't achieved anything meaningful without strong partners. And um, the key is really, I always say to my team when we're building a partnership, I should be thinking about the other partner's goals and they should be thinking about our goals. I think that's key to effective partnership. The other is in our work, because we're a national organization, it's essential that we partner with community-based folks who understand what's happening on the ground. And that's a lot of listening, you know, listening to people and understanding, you know, what they need. I love that. Any other thoughts? In the big thing for us was setting kind of mutually reinforcing goals. So this structure mm -hmm. of, billing at your actual cost. Anytime we go in to say we need to be more efficient, we're not saying we want you to lose money or take a hit or do something you're not comfortable with. We're just saying let's work together and figure out how to reduce costs, how to source more donated food, how to make recipes that are more efficiently using labor time. So I think figuring out, like Nancy said, thinking about what each person, what partners need in it, but then setting goals and systems for how you measure that, that everybody can get behind is helpful. As an organization dealing a lot with logistics, we've, we've thought a lot about process, right? So um, you can have the best intentions, but unless it makes sense for those companies that you're partnering with to do, and it feels like it's part of their process, they're not going to do it. No one wants to do extra work. You've got to make it feel like they're doing something that they're proud about, that so their employees can get behind this, that they can market this, that it is strategically beneficial on so many levels, but also it's not increasing their cost or overall workload, unless that's part of what you've agreed on. So right. um, process has been really important to us. Our movers are in the home anyway. They're able to pick up the food from people moving. Then they bring it to a food bank local in their community. The same thing happens for our apartment network. We have 2,700 apartments, 500,000 apartment units across mm -hmm. the country that residents can now donate their food when they move out because we've made it part of that resident move out process. And for them, they want to be more socially responsible and sustainable and they're measuring their ESG goals. So we've given them a program or a process that they can utilize basically on a silver platter. And hopefully it's something that um, can uh, take over as, as the norm of an industry rather than just one company doing this. Right. All great points. I love that. And I, I guess actually just to take a step back, you know, there have been some speculations that the pandemic would lead to a continued increase of food insecure individuals, but lower levels of surplus food as businesses kind of learn how to adapt their operations. And so I know you scaled during COVID, but, you know, I want to kind of hear what you're seeing on the ground now. Like, are those speculations accurate? 100% accurate. I mean, <laughs> we're saying that, you know, yeah, food insecurity is just as high as ever and, and probably rising because of inflation and, and other reasons, especially with federal assistance coming to a close. And without question, I mean, um, the marketplace is efficient. And so businesses have decided there's much less produce, which has meant that in some cases we're not, we're purchasing produce and, and we're not able to use donated produce if we want to, you know, meet our meet our demands. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons I think it's so important, this integration, you know, building on what Robin was saying, there's more opportunity for more partnership that allows us to take these learnings and we need to get more efficient too, as the marketplace is getting more efficient, nonprofit organizations need to get more efficient. 
I think if the refeds of the world can help set some common metrics, you know, the six of us on the screen could partner. And, you know, really, I think, um, you, you know, the fact that we all do something slightly different and are chasing different metrics can be one of the barriers to, um, you know, we all have partners who are implementing partners, but that's very different from organizational partners, you know, partnering to have a bigger impact with more awareness of the challenges each other face. And that's where I think the opportunity is going forward. I think that's really helpful. And Nancy, I feel like every time you talk, I'm like, we've got to hang out because I feel like it's this bigger picture kind of thought process. Um, I will say one of our major partners in Toledo is Prometica. They're one of the largest healthcare providers um, in that part of the country. And they are doing a lot of what Nancy is talking about and looking at how do we create, how do we remove food deserts by putting these type of like, you know, non-manned grocery stores in places where people have access to produce and, and healthier meals because they're seeing the same stats that Nancy is talking about is when you, when you actually do increase that, uh, those healthy meals in these family systems, everything shifts. And what we're looking at is that, you know, the overall holistic approach to healthy living is not one piece, it's many pieces. And so how do we continue to articulate that, you know, a living wage, a roof over your head, healthy food in the cabinet, making sure that uh, kids can get to school, transportation, like all of these pieces are really, really informative. And so I do think it's, it's not easy. I want to say that like really out loud, all of the work that's happening so difficult because it is outside of the systems that have been constructed, but I am very encouraged by, I think this, and, and when you say partnership, that's genuine versus just a supplier or versus just someone who does this thing that you don't do. When you say partner, if you really mean that, that comes with a lot more relational capital and obligation to the folks that you're working with. So that's not really an answer, but I want to say, I think even though we are in different spaces, we're all kind of pushing for these really similar concepts that involve a, a lot heavier integration. Adam, do you have something you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, I think it really depends on, on where you're looking at, at the food, right? So um, I'm sure if you asked Aiden or, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, food waste on farms, He's going to be able to continue every day telling you, here's a whole list of farms that they're struggling. I mean, we, we talked to a farm yesterday that overproduced. Their yield was significantly higher um, than they thought it was going to be by like 100,000 pounds of yams. Um, that's not something that they planned for. Um, and I don't think the pandemic necessarily had anything to do with that. That's going to be kind of like a continuation. But then on the other side of things, I mean, you see it in the news every day, like all these supply chain issues. You can't buy anything. There's driver shortages. Um, there's reasons why people are just leaving the, the driving world in general, not to mention what's happening you know, with shipping. It's, it's a global challenge that we are facing right now. Um, and I think the pandemic really exacerbated that. So on top of all the issues that were creating food waste and food insecurity beforehand, you have this global logistics challenge. And by the way, a driver shortage is nothing new. Um, we've had driver shortages across many industries for years. Um, they're not being paid enough. Um, they're, they're not, you know, the, the industry needs some reform there across the board. Um, but, but I think there just needs to be better ways that we look at the systems. Where are we sourcing our food from? How are we getting it there? How are we doing it costly? It shouldn't be cheaper to, to get a truckload of strawberries from California to New Jersey than to get that same truckload of strawberries from California, from Southern California to Northern California. That's what we're seeing in a lot of cases, just because of how ridiculous the transportation system is right now. Yeah, um, we're getting a flood of questions, sorry, from the, from the chat. And so I wanna make sure the audience um, gets a chance to hear from you and, and kind of some of their specific questions. Um, and so maybe the, the most recent one we got, and actually maybe a few of you can speak to this is, you know, what do you, like, talk more about how you work with a food donor, maybe specifically a farmer who, you know, has labor costs and doesn't want to flood the market with his products and reduce prices, right? So how do you work with him to kind of explain how this all works, but help him, you know, feel comfortable with like the finances and economics of that? Any thoughts there? 
Well, you know, I'll just say that that's kind of what I was talking about when I was saying that, you know, some problems aggravate others. Like in the Mississippi Delta, we are purchasing pink-eyed purple-hulled peas from African-American farmers who've been underpaid for a long time. And one of the goals is increased wages for those farmers, which they deserve. And the other goal is we obviously want to secure for lower prices so that people who consume have affordable prices. That's why I'm saying we have to acknowledge that some of our goal, siloed goals you know, clash. The way we responded is by partnering with Ag Lunch in that area. And we're finding a way to get the farmers the wage they deserve and rescue the crops. And I think it means economically that some of the super low costs, you know, are, you know, are evaporating. I mean, you know, just to keep saying the holistically, you know, we've got to take the key issues, food waste, health, climate change, biodiversity, and livelihoods, and solve them in tandem. As long as one person solving only one and then aggravating two of the others, it isn't going to work. So some of our models aren't really sustainable models over the long term. And what we need is intellectual honesty and um, cross communication. Yeah, no, I, I we saw something similar. Um, we have a very large Hmong population in the Central Valley, specifically in the Fresno area, um, and a lot of really... Uh, active farmers who actually that's where they come from. So they're growing like culturally relevant crops for the folks that are in their communities, mm -hmm. but then also trying to offload those, those products as well. And, and that's where Kat Taylor's office was a huge partner for us because they were looking at affordable wages for um, non-traditional communities, like farmers that are coming from, uh, you know, different cultural backgrounds, selling cultural crops and trying to elevate those conversations and those individuals as actually having some say in their own supply chain and how do they actually get to distribute um, their crops to their community and then to the actual market, right? And so that was something that I'm like, no matter what I study in the next six months, I'm not going to be able to have those conversations because you need to deal directly with the farmers themselves and then you need to be kind of in at the political level you need to be having conversations with suppliers like there's this whole chain of command specifically in the food distribution world i think everybody here knows that and if you're not integrated at every level it's really hard to move the needle like almost impossible and so for us it was like we can we can take these products and get them to the communities. We can also get you some funding for you know a certain level of those crops at the wage that you're looking for, but we cannot compensate what you're looking to do with the farmer specifically. So it's like we have to we have to meet, you know, at, at that point, Kat's office exactly where they're at. And it was like we will check every box we have to to meet your criteria because no matter what, like we're going to get this food out the door. And so I think it is, again, it's a harder process, but taking a step back and saying, okay, like this is not the world we necessarily want to fight in the world of like supply chain and figuring out all of these pieces. But we know that it gets us to this end goal if we stick in this conversation long enough to be mutually beneficial. And so I think that that also is part of it is that sometimes out the gate, you have different objectives, but if you can take a minute to really talk through what those end goals are, that's really, really big. And, and I think also being mindful that the folks who are growing the food and you know actually gathering the food and packaging it, and there's just this whole disparity that exists there as well. And if we don't acknowledge that at every step of the way, in this food industry, we're doing a disservice to the whole story. So mm -hmm. saying that as well, I think is important. That's great. And we kind of on that note, we have another question coming in about, I guess, relationships with um, the, the charities or the kind of end recipients that work with um, food insecure individuals. And so, right, it sounds like rescue organizations are giving a lot and, and trying to understand how do you I guess, create kind of a, a full collaboration um, with end, or with agencies that work with end recipients. Any thoughts there? 
we we partner a lot with food banks um, and pantries and, and work to think about what their needs are. I mean, ultimately, as a food recovery organization, we need a place to deliver the food to, right? So um, it, in, in our mind, they are a great partner to ultimately get that food distributed. That is not something that our organization does. We don't distribute the food. We figure out how do we go get the food? How do we source the food? How do we even work with partner agencies who know these farmers or know where food waste is, is occurring and they can't get to it because they don't have transportation resources. Um, and, and that to us is that good partnership, that sharing of knowledge and resources. Um, we can go do what we do really well, which is figure out how do we go recover food. And then once that handoff is made, these other agencies and our partners can ultimately do what they do really well, which is ultimately distribute this food and deal with some of the underlying issues of food insecurity, which we all know as poverty. Um, and I think you know, something Nancy kind of hit on is, is, yes, this is a really challenging problem. And I know Chanel said this too, like this is a really challenging problem. There's not gonna be one solution. Um, we have to tackle it understanding how everything's working, but we also need to really be focused on what we do best, whether it's Chanel looking at technology um, or Aiden, you know, looking at, you know, transportation and the relationships with farmers. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, with, with our organization, we're not going to be able to focus on wages per se, but we can partner with organizations that are thinking about those things. Um, and then we can complement each other as we look to deliver more impact together. I, I'm gonna throw a wrench. I think you're right, Adam, and I appreciate you and I would work with you anytime because you, that's exactly right. But I think what we ran into, and maybe this is something you all can speak to as well, like with the food bank specifically, they've been around a long time, most of them have, um, and their funding sources are fairly traditional, like, and, and they have funders who want certain things, and a lot of them that are localized it's even more rigid and they're pretty hardcore about where those dollars go and what they look like and who spends them and what that means. And so that was like mind blowing when we first got into this, I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, I think this is going to help. Like, I think that, and they're like, I don't, we're not sure. And luckily our local food bank here, which is one of the largest ones in California had like a, a changing of the guard, like through the pandemic. And so it was like this, all right, like let's dive in and figure this out. But that was something that was very new and maybe something that's particularly related to the question that was asked in the chat is that like organizations, specifically nonprofits, I mean, funding sources and how funders expect their dollars to behave and then ongoing funding, like what was, I mean, I mean, I'm asking the group, I guess, but like, what was that experience or has you, you know, is that something that you're finding true as well? Cause that was just something I did not expect to encounter in a, we're all driving towards the same solution essentially. And like, you know, bringing in funding for these efforts, but it was a much messier world than I anticipated. Yeah, it's true. You know, having run a food bank for five years, that is true. You know, that's one of the challenges. Donors who give to hunger want the money to go for hunger and maybe not, you know, rescue collection or something like that. I mean, creative leaders can solve those problems, but I think one of the bigger problems for me when I was running the food bank of the rescued food was um, how, how on its last legs it was. A lot of the rescued food would come into the food bank and if it weren't like out the door in 24 hours, it was really beyond what you would you know, get if you bought in a grocery store and, and beyond what most people on the screen would choose for their families and themselves. And so I think there's a need for a lot of innovation and infrastructure, um, cold storage, but you know, there are also all sorts of creative things using avocado oils on skins, natural ways to extend the life of produce that I think need and deserve more attention. Um, because a lot of the rescued food we took in, you know, just couldn't make it, you know, out on a truck and turn, you know. In, in 48 hours, it was, it was really beyond, so. Aiden or Robin, I, I think I saw you guys on mute, wanted to make sure you guys had a chance to speak if you had other thoughts. Sure, um, I, yeah, I, 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 I guess my philosophy on this is, I mean, we saw, in our personal experiences, we saw, you know, food rescue coming uh, <clears throat> less from, like a wholesale market and more directly from farms. 
we, we, we our, our farm partners realize that they're saving more on cold storage and transportation than they were making on trying to sell to these secondary markets. And that kind of meant like an added difficulty for community-based organizations or local food banks to get this food because of mostly transportation costs. So if you wanted to integrate into a community, if you wanted to um, uh, be a community-based organization and source from farms yourself, you're gonna be stretched thin. I, I, I didn't know very many, I don't know very many um, who could do that end to end, but there are many who can do one part of that supply chain. And I think that's a huge aspect of all of this, uh, even circling back to our conversation around partnerships is, the organizations having a level of self-awareness of what their what their strength is and and uh, how they can tap into the strengths of others to make that end-to-end -end, um, situation possible. Um, I'm like a broken record at FarmLink talking about you know have a mindset of don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Instead, look for the pieces that are there in place that you need to support to like create that more robust chain and and. Um, that that's why I, I really preach sort of the self-awareness of okay, we know how to we know how to get a truck to the farm and we know how to find the people who may need it. And we need to find the organizations that know what to do with it, can handle it, and have are integrated in the community in a way that will never be because they have been there for 25 years, for example. Um and 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 provide support for those organizations. So that's sort of my philosophy just surrounding this entire conversation with um, how to work with these these food banks that are stretched thin for funding and also how to partner in general to make sure that we're getting food to the right people. Aiden, I, I would also add on top of that, though, um, because I, I agree 100 percent with exactly what you're saying, like play to your skill set and partner with those right folks that you can amplify with together. But then also not forgetting the folks like Robin they're coming kind of in with, with new programs where, you know, they haven't been around for 25 years and they're doing things differently than these food banks are today. And if we can support them and figure out ways to help them do this at scale where they can all of a sudden accept two trailer loads of butternut squash and figure out how to go you know, get, turn those into meals and get those out quickly. That's a lot different than what some of these food banks are, are doing or have been doing traditionally. I think you're starting to see that changeover. Um, with this in the space because they have to um but it's it's been very interesting kind of seeing some of the new solutions that have happened realistically a lot of it be, because of COVID-19 I think some of it was starting to turn before then but COVID-19 like you're hearing more and more of these new models and uh I think it just represents new opportunities for partnership yeah, absolutely yeah that was my comment never waste a good crisis I mean I am um, housed within a very traditional big food bank, right? And the type of work I do was always intimidating because the meal I'm delivering costs 15 times more than getting somebody groceries. Um, but we know it can be made in community. We know it's guaranteed people will eat it because it's been processed in a way that makes it accessible and ready to eat and customized for people's, you know, dietary and food preferences. And so in some ways that's more efficient, but it's hard to think of it that way when you see the price tag the first time around. So I think everybody who's come up against walls with the traditional food bank network, I just encourage you to like go back in this time of change and, you know, be, be resilient in pursuing us. God, I love that, Robin. I actually want to steer the conversation a bit and as in our few minutes together, kind of hear from this group, like, Looking ahead 10 years from now, what does food recovery ideally look like? What are we doing differently? How have we become more efficient and effective? What are the innovative things we're doing? And you guys have been in this space for a long time. So we'd love to hear kind of vision for you and an ideal state. That's a big question. <laughs> Well, I think some of these, you know, others have said it already, but I think it's a key point to underscore innovation. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to come in with new solutions, new delivery models, um, you know, building on some of what each person is doing. There are new opportunities. There were two big disruptions in COVID. One was people who were lower income were, who had been very resistant to come online were 
in online and much greater percentages. So that's one big disruption. And there was a big disruption in delivery. And there's an opportunity for a lot more disruption in delivery, you know, along the lines of what Aiden's doing. So I think the more creative we can get, you know, leveraging those two disruptions. Um, and then I think we have to, um, you know, set some hard challenges, like how do we have farmers get higher wages and, you know, rescue food and have people eating healthier food and um, which that's going to require us not to accept some of the limits and paradigms we've always accepted, you know, previously, you know, we have to redefine what things look like. I, I do very much agree with Robin that this crisis creates an opportunity to think outside the box, you know, so I think it will look very different. And again, just to underscore, I'd like to see more of us at the solution level working horizontally with each other, because I think that will produce better results and, and will not be easy, but will be important. Yeah. Go ahead, I think, Adam, or Adam, Adam, go ahead. Yeah, you're up. Yeah. Um, I think of two things. One is economics, right? It, it has to make sense financially for us to stop wasting food. And I think, I mean, Refed has more than made the case um, of why food waste is just a ridiculous economic issue for companies, for farmers, for across every stakeholder that is, is here should not be wasting food for the, for the economic reasons. And I think some of the stuff that Aiden is doing is trying to make it easier um, for people to take advantage of those incentives. So I think that that will uh, be one piece of the puzzle. And the other part of this is ease. I mean, even when you think about like composting at home, um, it's it's a bucket on your counter. It's a bin out back. It's like, this is not an easy process to get someone to all of a sudden stop throwing things in the trash um, and, and figuring out a way to, to go and tackle this problem. So you have to make it easy. I mean, what we're really excited about with our multifamily partnerships, which right now is focused on the non-perishable, but we have 500,000 apartment units that we have access to. We have large, you know, property management companies like Cortland and Bell and Equity Residential that are continuing to build and manage um, places where people live and work as well. How do we incorporate, you know, food waste reduction composting into the design of these communities? Um, I think that's, that's where we need to go. And, and that goes back to the farm in terms of putting cold storage um, resources there and creating hubs. It has to be easy or people will not participate and it has to be economically viable or it will not sustain. So I don't know exactly what the future looks like, but I know that those two things are a big part of making this successful. That's great. Thank you. And I know we only have one minute left. So unfortunately, there's, we have to wrap up our discussion, but this has been amazing. And um, we'll definitely send out a recap after this. Um, so thank you all for joining us today and sharing your expertise and insights with us. Um, and a huge thanks to all of our audience members for joining us today. Um, lots of work happening, but please feel free to let your colleagues and friends know that they can take action by joining Refed's network. Check out our new Food Waste Action webpage where you can find upcoming events. Um, and please know that our aim is to design the network programming to drive action across the food waste space. As such, we're always looking for opportunities to improve our programming. So if you could just take a moment to quickly provide us with your feedback by answering those poll questions that have appeared on the screen, um, your responses will be anonymous. So if you have any additional feedback, just feel free to email my colleague Lily at lily.herd at refed.com. Um, I'll give people a couple seconds, get your responses in there. Thank you so much. Great. Well, and on that note of programming, we do have a couple of events coming up this month. We do have one next week on October 14th, where we'll be hosting a webinar highlighting how solution providers can partner with Refed. Um, and if you're looking for ways to scale action, don't miss this webinar. We're sending the registration link through the chat. So please register today. Um, and finally, if you like today's event, join our next installment of the following the webinar, uh, following the roadmap webinar series, which is focused on strengthening food rescue on October 20th. Uh, we have a stellar panel lined up and we hope to see you there. Um, and with that, 
Thank you again to our speakers and everyone for joining us today. I'm sorry we had to cut the discussion short, but we'll definitely see all of you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.